myself. Huh. I'm about to lose my world record. This book has the, uh, the, uh, the, the greatest exploration of the connection between the Grateful Dead and the Beats ever in print <laughs> by anybody, anywhere, ever. Sadly, that's true, that's true. Sadly, I'm about to lose that record because I've written a new piece for the, uh, a book coming out next year called Kerouac on Record, edited by uh, Jim Sampas and Simon Warner. Shout out to you guys all across the world. So I've done this new huge thing on the connection between all the members of the dead and the songwriters in the dead and the family of the dead and how they were all connected to Jack Kerouac, which is really essential. Uh, so here's this, it's going to be in the Bloomsbury book, maybe those guys will be here next year in 2018, which is going to be like the, the uh, what is it going to be, the X number of anniversary, we could use those. Um, <laughs> And it's going to be like, uh, 60, like 68 was uh, Duluwa's, 58 was uh, Subterraneans and Dharma Bums. So next year, you all want to be here because it's going to be, we have three masterpieces we're going to be celebrating from all these stages for five days next year. But, uh, and, the, and that, this Kerouac on Record book on Bloomsbury will be out next year, so you might want to uh, get that. So I'm going to read you just a little bit of the intro and then the outro of The Grateful Dead, Jack manifested as music. The Grateful Dead were Jack manifested as music. Their essence was born of the same road adventures. Oh, nobody's ever heard this before, but this is the first time anybody, anybody other than the editor of the book has ever read or seen or heard a word of this. Hope that's okay, Simon. <laughs> Um, their essence was born of the road and adventures. They worked in improvisational music like spontaneous prose. They broke every rule of showbiz, then broke every concert record there is. Just as Kerouac broke every rule of grammar, then had over 50 books in print. Like Jack, the band had a prolific career whose output spanned multiple genres and decades and had many different co-conspirators and found inspiration in the mythical characters of the West and the open road. And they both considered Neil Cassidy their driving force. In fact, he literally drove each of them on the road. <laughs> Both the Beats and the band had a core member who drank himself to an early grave, and others who spent considerable time and effort exploring the benefits of psychotropic drugs. Both groups were largely based out of San Francisco, and both had New York as their other home. And in fact, it was the very same neighborhoods in both cities, North Beach and Greenwich Village where each came of age before growing out into the rest of the city and world. San Francisco has a centuries-old history of radicals, rebellion, and reinvention, from Jack London to John Muir, Haight-Ashbury to Silicon Valley. The Bay Area has nurtured iconoclasts and outcasts, fostering new paradigms since its founding, be they environmental or cyber, free love or free jazz, great gay rights or immigrants' plights. And hence, when Carolyn Robinson first moved to the city and planted the flag that would beckon her future husband, Neil Cassidy, years before Lawrence Ferlinghetti or any of the other beats ever first set foot in the place, it was a town that already personified everything the burgeoning movement was about. It was an outsider's oasis, a North American version of a European masterpiece of architecture to dis inspire every walking breath. A multi-hilled town of innumerable little villages, each with a thousand stories pouring out of every three-story Victorian house. And Jack fell in love, not only with Carolyn and his life brother Neil, and so much so that he actually moved there briefly with his mother in 1957, but also with the mirror city spirit of his beloved New York. The jazz clubs, the neighborhood bars, the openness and effervescent, ever-changing characters and concepts that sprung from every five-cent coffee or ten-cent beer. 
And just as the Beat's work brought this open-minded, life-embracing sense of adventure to the rest of the world, so too did the music that manifested there in the mid-60s. Bob Dylan may have gone electric on the East Coast, but the real electricity of Kool-Aid rock and roll came from the West, young man. The dead were proud, flag-waving beats who were keeping the beat in a whole new way. Just as Jack took a novel approach to ja novel construction, the band did the same with song structure. Just as Jack soloed on the keys, stretching his flow and ideas to places heretofore unseen, so did that other Jay, Jerry, play his lines into a whole new space unheard in music, save for the best of Jack's beloved bebop. The dead were not only the natural progression of the music of the beats, but also of the very city that was home to both. In fact, Jack was so comfortable with each, he easily recast the subterranean's events from New York to San Francisco in just three days of writing. Unlike most bands and authors, both the Grateful Dead and Kerouac's popularity only grew after their primary heartbeat stopped. With the Dead's 2015 Fair Thee Well shows in Chicago breaking Ticketmaster, pay-per-view, and Soldier Field all-time records. And Kerouac having roughly four times as many books in print today as he did the day he died. Not to mention the thousands of dead-based bands playing around the world as you're listening to this. Or the hundreds of copies of On the Road that will be bought somewhere every day that you're here at LCK. Yet, they both had inauspicious professional debuts. The Dead's first album and Jack's The Town and the City. Which, in most cases, would have presaged an undistinguished career and certainly not be indicative of an artist who would end up changing their medium and worldwide culture. And both had an unusually strong affinity for the other's form. Garcia was a voracious reader of books, and few novelists have lived a life with as strong a connection to music as Jack. And the Grateful Dead were the only band that either Jack or Neil would ever sit in with. Really, it was, as it always seems to be, Neil Cassidy at the center of the whole damn thing. No other rock band can, can claim anywhere near as close a connection to any one of the key beats as the Grateful Dead can with their brother Neil. He lived in their house, ate at their table, drove their bus, performed on stage with them, and directly inspired some of their most oft-performed songs, including The Other One and Cassidy, not to mention Truckin' is a musical on the road, or Warfrat is their Big Sur, or Addicts of My Life, their Book of Dreams, or the Mexicali Blues echoes Mexico City Blues, or China Cat Sunflower could have been lifted right out of Old Angel Midnight, and on and on and on. But Cassidy, 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 God. The guy Jack most wanted to impress, Ditto Allen, the mighty muse, and just as with them, he was there from the beginning with the dead. On the bill or on the stage at many of their original acid tests, including their now legendary first big venue gig, the Trips Festival at the Longshoremen's Hall and good old SF. And now this thing goes on for like 7,000 words with all sorts of amazing quotes by all sorts of amazing, every single member of the dead and both the songwriters and all tributizing our man Jack. So you gotta get the book next year to get that picture. But here, here's how it ends. Starting before Jack left us and continuing decades afterwards, no single creative entity in America caused more people to go on the road than did the Grateful Dead. They were Jack and Neil writ large. They were the world's largest travel agency, <laughs> both physically and psychically. 
Where Cassidy expanded the road trip from a Hudson to a school bus, the dead turned the bus into a spaceship. They were the music of Jack's writing. There could be lulls and left less than polished passages, but they were always leading to explosions of unequaled color and light and joy and life. And like Jack's books, the dead's performances were not formulaic, conventional, predictable, or repetitious. And their songs celebrated the lives and aspirations of the American everyman, the working man, like one of their definitive albums, Working Man's Dead. And they both painted American beauty, lived on the American road, sang songs of the road like Whitman before them, and spawned a trip that more adventurers jumped on than any other in history. Jack may have written the book, but the dead extended his vision into a functioning road lifestyle that then birthed a festival culture that is the thriving nationwide six gallery of the 21st century. Oh. I thought that was good. <laughs> <laughs> And the band put their money where their heart was, including being primary funders of the aforementioned On the Road Jack Kerouac Conference in Boulder in 1982 that I wrote a whole adventure book about. Boom. Available now, my copies last. Uh, that, that summit, which included Ken Kesey and fellow core pranksters Ken Babs and one George Walker, plus Abby Hoffman, Timothy Leary, and every living beat from Alan to Gregory to Bill to Holmes, along with all the key women, from Carolyn Cassidy to Edie Kerouac to Jack's daughter Jan, uh, not to mention three shows by the band at nearby Radio City, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Red Rocks. They're so similar. Uh, amphitheater. <laughs> ended up changing the world's perception of Kerouac, which had plummeted to near irrelevancy in the 70s. But that genius of organization and promotion, Allen Ginsberg, and I love the, I think it was Ferlinghetti came up with the line, um, what the Beat Generation was, was really just the Friends of Allen Ginsberg generation. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. Uh, where the hell was it? Allen Ginsberg, in his wisdom, brought together the 60s offspring, as well as the living original Beats, to rally the troops and share love stories with the next generation of scholars, journalists, academics, acolytes, practitioners, and pranksters. <laughs> The result was an author who had been largely out of print and out of mind began a resurgence that has continued unabated to this day, all stemming from an event funded by the Grateful Dead. And the commitment didn't end with Garcia's passing in 1995 and the retirement of the Grateful Dead entity. Kicks Joy Darkness with Robert Hunter was 1997. Uh, his Dr. Sachs portrayal in, uh, was in 2003. And the One Fast Mover I'm Gone documentary was 2009. Phil Lesh's tribute to Neil came out in 2005. And Bill Kreutzmann's reverential remembrance was 2015. And in 2007, Bob Weir did a Kerouac-themed show right here in Jack's birthplace of Lowell, as well as a talk and Q&A with Jack and Dead biographer Dennis McNally. And both Weir and McNally gave extensive filmed interviews to Walter Salas in 2010 for the documentary On the Road that is yet to be released. So they're still on about it to this day. Because love for real, not fade away. Fade away. Yeah.